every time I watch this movie, I still think it has a maturity to it that I really appreciate. And I will admit this this love at first sight concept is a big conceit of this movie. And by the end of the movie, you wonder were they really in love, and what is being in love, and was this just a really intense infatuation? But mm. I was kind of smitten by their relationship in general. But um, I just. I think people hate Stephen Dorff a lot. <laughs> God, yeah, this movie, but... yeah, and that's the thing. I don't hate, even like in Blade. I mean, I, I know that people have a problem with him in Blade. I never did. I, I think if this would had been a movie that, like you, I saw when I was younger, yeah, I might have more, like, because I had those relationships when I was younger, the, you know, really intense, really uh, all-consuming relationships and and now I, I'm, you know, I'm watching the movie and I'm like, stop calling him while he's trying to work. <laughs> yeah. Cynical bastard. <laughs> yeah. It, and that's, but that's how I'm, I'm just thinking like, he's on, he's working right now. Can it not wait? <laughs> Why do you have to be bothering him right now? And it, I, I looked at it more as somebody who, I, and you know, I, I don't know how old they're supposed to be. I know Stephen Dwarf would have been, Probably in his, probably in his early to mid twenties. Yeah, correct. Around that time, so you know, if he had been much old, if he had been sort of forty, that would have I would have been like, "You're a fucking idiot." <laughs> yeah. But being younger, I could sort of I could go, okay, you know, they're swept up in this thing. I remember feeling that and everything, but I, I don't know. Like you said, just coming at it now older and not having any sort of nostalgia for it it i'm just watching people making stupid decisions mm. and uh and thinking to myself why are you doing this you know well let me ask you some more questions because i want your opinions on this the aesthetics now this movie has an as a way of narrating and executing and editing what did you think of that very 90s but i still think mm. some of the things he was doing was pretty cool at the time. That wasn't mean as Woody Allen's definitely used some of this inspiration. Right. But what did you think of that? Um, it. I mean, it was it was different than say Annie Hall or a movie that that uh, does talking to the camera and narration really well is High Fidelity. But High Fidelity, it's just sort of John Cusack stopping in the middle of everything and turning to the camera and addressing. The audience but he's normally alone when he's doing it. it's not stopping like a, you know the movie the characters don't freeze around him and everything and this was interesting in that sort of he just a scene will stop and he'll step into it from this one moment he's always in his boxer shorts and a t-shirt and uh you know telling the audience this is what's happening and that was different than than things i'd I can't think of any other movie that did it quite like that. Did it help? Do you think it worked? I th I think you didn't necessarily need it. Like I wouldn't have been lost if the narration hadn't been there. And I do think that like acting wise, those were the moments where it felt like watching somebody, you know, in a, in a low rent play, mm -hmm. the way that he was delivering the lines, but uh, it was visually interesting just mm. you know especially there's one where um uh, one part where he's he's in uh you know he's getting up out of bed and so you still see him on one side of the screen while he's coming in from the other side of the screen to narrate which i thought was uh was done really well again i don't know that it, it necessarily worked as well as something definitely i mean obviously like it didn't work as well as Annie Hall and uh, I would say it didn't work as well as high fidelity, but it, it, and you're right. You're right. It's like a very nineties kind of a, kind of a thing to do in your movie. But um, I mean, this whole thing reminded me a lot of, because th this would have been the time where I was just starting to try and get into the film business myself. And this reminded me of like everybody's, low budget film hmm. that they were trying to make at that time everybody was trying to do this kind of a movie but again that's why i think i i'm 
I leapt to the conclusion that it, there would be some sort of crime element to it because everybody also had to put that in at the time. But this being just sort of a straightforward romance, I don't know that you necessarily needed the narration, but it didn't detract from the movie either. Hmm. So, score. Um, obviously, you two are in the movie, and the reason why they're in the movie is because in real life, they know the director. Uh, we'll talk, I want to have a big talk about the real life happenings of this movie and how it came to be, but you two are in the movie as well a bit self-referential they do some of the soundtrack as well as well as the score what did you think did you think very nice i know you were going to say that anyway mm. <laughs> but do you think it lent well to the emotional scenes did you feel the music the score what did you think well i like you too so uh it wasn't <laughs> uh if it had been a different band i might have been irritated by it but the music worked in, you know, it didn't have like the like they were picking just 90 songs out of out of uh, the the indie scene. The fact that actually this was the biggest band in the world at the time. Mm -hmm. That was a major get for them. Very big. Um, yeah. But. Um, you know, there's the there's the part where Bono comes on the TV and is kind of talk that 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 part did confuse me where he's. He's talking to him on the TV while Stephen Dorff is dead drunk and trying to <laughs> convince him to like slow down and stop and everything. And then Stephen Dorff gets up to leave and he tries to open the door and the, he's like, you know, Irish bastard locked me at locked me in. And I'm like, how did how did he get locked in? <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, surreal. It's a very surreal scene. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, and th those were the moments that maybe bothered me a little bit where it, it was sort of like you know there's a, a scene where he's talking to a cat and the cat is or the cat is talking to him and i was sort of like what is happening right now is this <laughs> actually happening or is this in his is he drunk uh what is what's going on right now yeah that stuff <laughs> didn't work for me as much but having bono in it they they did a good job and i i think it was it felt like a i mean obviously this is based on the director's life and and the director did work with them but it also felt like a case of um you know sometimes you'll have access to something and you build your movie around that you know yeah. like oh we've you know we've got all these monster masks we're going to make a monster movie and we're going to write it around the fact that we have these costumes and masks. Uh, it felt like, oh, I have access to you too. So I'm going to write things around that and, and bring them into it in a way that felt somewhat natural, but I was always very confused at like, uh, what Bono's role actually was as his friend. Yeah. And I'm going to, I think what we need to do now is basically move to the element where I'm the most surprised. And for all my love of watching this movie for years, just thinking it was a straightforward love story, something, I, I, there was something about this story, just like you, you were surprised it didn't turn into a 90s Tarantino-esque crime thriller at the end or something. And I felt that way. there was something about this movie that was, I felt was off. So I found, even, again, being a fan of this movie for so long, I never found an interview, I never understood the director and why its conception or where it came from. Turns out that this was basically based off the director's life. The director, Phil Jonanu, has been a long-time worker in Hollywood, and this movie is him basically getting stuff off his chest. And especially this relationship between him the main character jake and judith godrenche or stella seems to be a relationship he had and in the interview which i will link in the description down below it was done in 20 i think it was 2016 after he did another movie people just asked him about his filmography and entropy was a movie he never got released that he basically poured his heart out and apparently if you read the interview it was actually steven spielberg <laughs> that convinced him to put it all out there like a Woody Allen movie. I think he said that for Baton, like, 
you know, do something like Woody Allen and just put it all out there. So he was, I mean, he was directly inspired to do something like Woody Allen and put it out there. So, I mean, this is another movie that was clearly adjacent to Woody Allen because he was directed to do that. And there was catharsis for him to do that. And in the interview, he goes into detail about that. And now watching the movie, realizing that it's basically a true story and he's just getting this relationship and his movie career and most of the big parts of this movie actually happened. It kind of makes more sense. Like, yeah, in the nineties, I, I, when I showed people this movie in the nineties, they were just like, what? This isn't like any other movie. The romance is, it's not cheesy enough to be a, like a, a chick flick, but then it's, kind of kinetic and has that dynamic editing and energy of a tarantino film but it's still a romance at heart i mean i didn't get it my friends didn't get it but i loved it and knowing it's a true story does make it make sense to me especially that it's about the director